A Fond du Lac County Sheriff's deputy has been cleared of any wrongdoing in an officer-involved death from late last year. Yeah, the investigation into the October incident determined the suspect died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The shooting took place at Drury Place in the city of Fond du Lac. Not only left the suspect, Kyle Massey, dead, but the Fond du Lac County Sheriff's canine Iroh was critically injured, too. Emily Matesic has a closer look at the investigation in this Fox 11 follow-up. The Fond du Lac County District Attorney determined Deputy Blaine Evans was justified when he fired more than 40 rounds at 33-year-old Kyle Massey on October 14th of 2023. There is no basis to consider or issue any criminal charges in this circumstance against Deputy Evans or any other law enforcement officer that assisted. I found that his actions were privileged in self-defense. According to an investigation conducted by the Department of Justice Division of Criminal Investigations, the incident started just before 6 a.m. on October 14th. A woman called 911 to report she had been raped and held against her will overnight by Kyle Massey at his Drury Place home. Deputy Evans and K-9 Ira were in the dispatch center when the call came in. So with five minutes left in his shift, he and Ira loaded up in the squad car. As he was traveling towards Massey's home, Deputy Evans crossed paths with the suspect. The deputy attempted to pull Massey over, but he didn't comply. The two ending up in the driveway and garage of Massey's home. That's when Deputy Evans is getting out of the vehicle and then seeing um, Kyle Massey with the AR style rifle, giving him <clears throat> commands to stop, which he's not following. So Deputy Evans fires the first two rounds Kyle Massey had not yet fired. And then Deputy Evans sent Iroh in to assist. And then Deputy Evans came under fire after Iroh was hit as he was backing away. In a matter of 31 seconds, Deputy fired more than 40 shots towards Massey, who fired 11 shots of his own. The investigation determined Massey was hit two times by Deputy Evans' fire, and K-9 Iroh was hit three to five times by Massey. And you saw Iroh, um, you know, following orders and running into that scene and buying Blaine a little more time to uh, what we refer to as get off the X, get off the mark, uh, reload, reposition, and uh, stay in the fight. After the gunfire had ended, Deputy Evans then heard one single gunshot coming from Massey. An autopsy determined that shot, which was self-inflicted, killed Massey. Two of Deputy Evans' rounds did strike uh, Kyle Massey. We don't know when those rounds would have struck him in relation to if it was the uh, Deputy Evans firing while he was in the garage or after he had backed out, but those were determined to be non-fatal injuries according to the medical examiner. While Deputy Evans has been cleared of any wrongdoing and is now off paid administrative leave, he won't be in his squad full-time just yet. He'll be working patrol part-time and taking Iroh, his canine partner, to therapy the rest of the time. Reporting in Fond du Lac County, Emily Matesic, Fox 11 News. Now, the story of this injured canine captivated the Fond du Lac community, and support came in from across the region. Following several surgeries after the initial injuries, the dog was released from the hospital just six days after the shooting. Since then, Iroh's had follow-up procedures. He continues to go to therapy several times a week. The canine has not yet been cleared for duty, but the sheriff is hoping that it'll be back to work with his partner, Deputy Blaine Evans, by the end of the year. In fact, when he uh, came into my office, like he often does last week, he was nose in the air, sniffing around. He's not going to find drugs in my office, but uh, he's, he's in there smelling for drugs. He's doing his thing, and I think, honestly, if Iroh could talk, he would say, what's the fuss? Let's get back to work. Let's catch some bad guys. Let's find some drugs. Let's get back on the streets. And that day, I'm confident, will come that uh, Iroh will be able to do that. Prior to being injured, Iroh had been working for the sheriff's office for about a year and a half. Well, good afternoon. My name is Fond du Lac County District Attorney Eric Tony. I apologize for those of you in the media that we kept waiting. I had a meeting with the Massey family beforehand, wanted to make sure we were able to answer as many or all of their questions as possible before this was released to the public. Uh, certainly, uh, no doubt this has garnered a lot of attention with the circumstances as well as canine Iroh, uh, who was injured. And so what the role of the district attorney is in these officer-involved death investigations per statute is to determine if a crime was committed and if uh, anyone should be prosecuted in short. And one of the things we had hoped to have this review done a lot sooner 
given some unexpected medical issues and a busy caseload, it took us a little longer to finalize that review. Uh, but I am here to share the results of the officer involved death investigation from October 14th of 2023 in the city of Fond du Lac. Um, in the report that has been handed out, you'll see that um, Deputy Blaine Evans, his name is in that report. He had consented to his name being released in that report. And I think that's something important to share because in Wisconsin with the passage of Marcy's Law, uh, crime victims do have the right to privacy and that would extend to a law enforcement officer who may be the victim in an officer involved uh, death or shooting circumstance as we have here. So I think that's a credit to Deputy Evans for allowing even greater transparency for his name to be included in the report. So. Ultimately, we had a, a significant amount of information to review and the Department of Justice will post that uh, in redacted form on their website because DCI uh, completed this review and Special Agent Jay Yurgis was the lead on that. Very appreciative of Special Agent Yurgis and his work. He's got a lot of experience in these investigations and was uh, very helpful to me and my office in our review. And so for those of you that are looking for uh, reports or videos or audio, you would go to the Department of Justice website for that. If you contact the Sheriff's Office or the City of Fond du Lac Police Department, in most circumstances, they will likely direct you to the Department of Justice website. Uh, so ultimately, I wanna give a little background on the uh, circumstances that led to this officer-involved death investigation. Uh, we had a female victim that ultimately escaped the residence where the shooting occurred and reported to law enforcement that she, and, and I, I was a little reluctant to share some of these details, but I think given the circumstances, it is important uh, based on the actions that occurred in the aftermath, but reported a sexual assault by Kyle Massey being held against her will, that firearms were pointed at her, that she observed that the uh, gun was loaded based on seeing the clip and a bullet fall out as well at one point. She was able to escape in the early morning hours and contact the uh, dispatch city of Fond du Lac police officer, was able to find her and take her to the Fond du Lac police department for a more detailed statement. As this 911 call was coming in, Deputy Evans was at the communication center and responded to the scene with his canine Iro in his vehicle. He spotted Kyle Massey's vehicle and he began to follow the vehicle activating his emergency lights and siren from a fully marked Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Office squad. Uh, Kyle Massey, his vehicle did not comply and then Deputy Evans attempted a pit maneuver to stop the vehicle which occurred right at or before the driveway to Kyle Massey's residence. The driveway is off of Western Avenue. The house itself has a Drury Place address 591. And as that was occurring, Kyle Massey's vehicle continued up the driveway, uh, essentially plowing through a partially open garage door into the garage. Deputy Evans stopped his squad car, exited his vehicle, releasing K-9 Iro. At this point, he was seeing um, what ultimately was Kyle Massey attempting to exit the vehicle with what was described as an AR-style rifle. And Deputy Evans was giving commands to stop, which were not followed. Deputy Evans fired the first two rounds and then told him to drop the gun and then commanded K-9 Iro to assist in trying to apprehend Kyle Massey. It was at that point that uh, Iro entered the garage. He was struck by three to five rounds according to the vet that performed the surgery. Uh, we were told three to five because some of the rounds may have ricocheted off the concrete, creating some other pathways where they weren't able to determine the exact number of uh, bullet wounds that Iro suffered. Uh, in total, um, Kyle Massey fired 11 rounds. Deputy Evans fired 45 rounds. And no rounds struck Deputy Evans. And after the initial two rounds that Deputy Evans fired, he began to back up. He came under fire by Kyle Massey uh, while he was behind a Jeep Cherokee. And he repositioned and then began uh, returning fire and continuing to move and reload. And Kyle Massey backed his vehicle out of the garage, ramming into the front end of Deputy Evans' squad car where Deputy Evans began to return fire again and then reposition. The total amount of time from the first round to the last round for Deputy Evans was about 31 seconds. 
and then City of Fond du Lac officers began arriving closer to the scene and Deputy Evans was making contact with some of those officers and on numerous body cam footage uh, from the audio or squad, you can hear a single gunshot at 6.13.01 a.m., which was determined to be the self-inflicted gunshot, which ultimately caused the death of Kyle Massey, according to Dr. Corliss, the medical examiner. Two of Deputy Evans' rounds did strike uh, Kyle Massey. We don't know when those rounds would have struck him in relation to if it was the uh, Deputy Evans firing while he was in the garage or after he had backed out, but those were determined to be non-fatal injuries according to the medical examiner. And ultimately, what our job as a district attorney is to look at and determine if any criminal charges should be issued. And there is no basis to consider or issue any criminal charges in this circumstance against Deputy Evans or any other law enforcement officer that assisted. I found that his actions were privileged in self-defense and that, as I noted, no charges are warranted. Deputy Evans had attempted the traffic stop with lights, sirens, and a pit maneuver. Uh, Kyle Massey was refusing to comply with his commands and then exiting with a long gun and Deputy Evans was privileged to use self-defense at that time because his beliefs were reasonable that Kyle Massey was attempting to get into a firing position on Deputy Evans based on those circumstances, the nature of the call that came out and there will be no charges that were issued. I commend Deputy Evans for his quick actions based on the circumstances uh, in this investigation with Kyle Massey having been at the residence and then leaving with the AR rifle, it seems likely that he was looking for the female victim that had escaped the residence, whether it was to find her, bring her back or what, I'm, I'm not going to speculate, but Deputy Evans helped end a threat to the community as it's unknown what Kyle Massey could or would have done if he had remained in the residence or attempted to go somewhere else based on those circumstances. and his uh, quick actions are a credit to our community. It's a very, any of these are difficult for law enforcement in our community across the state as well as for the Massey family who lost a loved one. Uh, their family certainly uh, had no role or part in this and they continue um, to grieve as well. And this has certainly gotten a lot more attention because of the injuries to um, IRO, but I, I think it's important that we also think about Deputy Evans and his quick actions. These are actions that uh, law enforcement with traffic stops that they do on a routine basis and never know when a circumstance might rise to this level, whether they have information that it's a gun call or not. We're blessed to have incredible law enforcement throughout our county, our Fond du Lac Police Department, as well as our Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Office, and for that I'm very grateful. And I know Sheriff Walshmitt will be up here in a moment to give a little bit of an update as well. But uh, there is uh, one, I want to maybe just end with a quote from Deputy Evans. But the report that you have has a timeline. That timeline is based on the review of the audio and video from Dash and Body Camera. Happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. But uh, after the self-inflicted gunshot, there was a significant effort to get medical care to uh, K-9 IRO, and I think the sheriff will probably talk a little bit about uh, some of those efforts, so I'll let him do that. But uh, prior to that uh, surgery, Deputy Evans said to IRO, you save dad and we have to save you. And that's exactly what uh, our law enforcement did. Uh, Charles Beckford, city of Fond du Lac police officer, was instrumental in those efforts, credit and thanks to the Grand Chute Police Department as well and very grateful um, for the condition that IRO is in based on the updates we've seen from the sheriff's office as well. So uh, I don't have anything else to add at this time, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Otherwise, I'm gonna invite Sheriff Walshmitt up and we can take some questions after that. Sheriff, if you wanna come up. Thank you everybody for your continued interest and support and I, I want to highlight a couple of the um, circumstances that District Attorney Eric Tony spoke of. <clears throat> I think it's important to note when this thing uh, kicked off at 5.55 in the morning, 
Deputy Evans was in the communication center with his canine IRO uh, speaking with dispatchers and it was five minutes to the end of his shift. He could have just as easily went home, shrugged his shoulders and said, well, this call doesn't sound good, but it's not my problem. Um, it's in the city of Fond du Lac. The police department will handle it. But it goes to the character and integrity of Deputy Evans who saw the change in the posture of the dispatcher, heard the change in her tone of voice when she took that 911 call from that brave victim that uh, sustained quite a, a, a severe and brutal night and who thankfully was able and brave enough to break free from her captor who held her against her will all night long and uh, she made a run for it and thankfully uh, she survived and she was able to get out of that situation and call for help. Deputy Evans, looking over the dispatcher's shoulder, uh, read the comments to the call, learned of the weapons involved, learned the details of the nature of uh, what that victim was reporting and what she had, had endured all night long. And he knew that uh, he and his partner, Iroh, may be able to effectuate a positive change or a positive result or help out at this situation. And so with five minutes left in his shift, he and Iroh loaded up in the squad car. Deputy Evans pulled up the map on his computer to look at the residents and the residential neighborhood that he was responding to. That location's just a couple miles, uh, probably about a mile west of the communication center. And he recognized that the front of the house had a Drury Place address, but the rear of the house, uh, where the garage was and where the driveway was, actually came out onto Western Avenue. It was kind of a unique block with the house address and the front of the house facing one street, but the rear and backyard of that house facing another street. So he proceeded west on Western Avenue, and when he got to the intersection of uh, Western and Seymour is when he came face to face with the suspect who had just left his home, who we knew, uh, know now, uh, was armed with a rifle. That rifle was obviously readily accessible, and I believe that that suspect uh, left home to hunt down his victim. When he realized the victim had broken free from his captivity and was uh, you know, no longer in the residence, I truly believe he was leaving home with one intent and that was uh, to locate that victim and either uh, take her captivity again or who knows what, uh, the fact that he's armed with that rifle, readily accessible. But when he meets Deputy Evans face to face at that intersection, he changes direction, he makes a couple right hand quick turns, travels past his house and he's headed back around the block and Deputy Evans picked up on that right away. And he's got just a few seconds to make a lot of important decisions at that moment. He knows if the suspect gets back home, the suspect's back on his turf, back in that tactical advantage, the suspect gets in the house, he may have access to more weapons, uh, the suspect knows his yard, knows his property, knows the outbuildings on the property, knows the neighborhood much better than Deputy Evans does. And Deputy Evans uh, follows that suspect around the block, activates his emergency lights, activates his siren, attempts a pit maneuver, um, and the suspect continued to not follow those uh, visual cues and audible cues uh, in an attempt to stop him. That suspect had a lot of opportunity to change the course of the direction of his fate and he failed to take all of them. He could have stopped when the lights went on, he could have stopped and surrendered when the siren went on, he could have stopped when the pit maneuver occurred, and instead he decided to travel into that garage, crash through a closed garage door or a partially closed garage door, and immediately get out of his car swinging an AR-15 in the direction of Blaine Evans. Now thankfully, Iroh is there with Blaine, it's a two-man team. Uh, one human, obviously one canine, and Iroh's deployed into that garage. And that distraction of Iroh coming at the suspect, I'm sure he did not anticipate a dog or a canine entering the garage. That distraction gave Blaine time to return fire, time to reposition, time to get to better cover, and undoubtedly saved Blaine's life and prevented further rounds from that rifle coming toward Blaine, and instead the suspect had to track and follow uh, Iroh as Iroh entered the garage to apprehend him. We know the rest of the story. The suspect at that moment again had a decision. He knew the deputy was outside. He knew the deputy was firing on him. He knew the canine was sent in. 
Time is collapsing and he's got decisions to make. He could have surrendered at that moment, but he chose to get back in the car, armed with the rifle, put it in reverse, crash back through the garage door, and crash into the front of the squad car that's blocking him in the driveway. Thankfully, that squad car was there because I fear to even speculate what would have happened if that squad car wasn't there, and now we get this subject mobile, armed with a rifle, already engaged in a firefight with law enforcement. Who knows where this would have led to and where this would have ended and how this would have ended. Thankfully, Blaine had the wherewithal to park his squad there, blocking him in effectively, and Blaine continued to return fire in an attempt to stop the threat, which is what we do. We return fire, we protect ourselves, we defend ourselves in an effort to stop the threat. And as soon as that threat ceases, we cease, and we in fact go into a saving mode, whether that mean in this case, once it's determined that the threat was neutralized, they got him out of the car, the suspects were moved from the vehicle, and life-saving measures were implemented. So again, the suspect drives our actions as is very often the case in these deadly force situations. No officer comes to work, no deputy comes to work with the intent on getting in a shootout with anybody. We're always hoping for a peaceful resolution to no matter what the circumstances are that we're working to address. But then we have uh, the suspect's family, and I know they're probably hurting. I know that they don't condone the activity that occurred over the course of that night with that victim. They don't condone the behavior of their loved one and the assault on law enforcement. I'm sure they have a lot of questions, and I certainly can sympathize and empathize with those struggles and the information that they're processing today and thinking about and ans uh, hopefully getting answers to some of their questions because they've been waiting patiently too for uh, the rest of the story and to know what occurred uh, to their loved one that night. But then there's the rest of the story. At this point, once the suspect's out of the car, life-saving measures are underway for him. Blaine Evans enters the garage to find I rolling in a pool of his own blood and enter into the scenario of Fond du Lac police officer Charles Beckford. Charles had responded from home. He was coming on duty as this event was unfolding. And Charles Beckford did not know that Iro had been struck and was down, shot, and wounded in the garage. And he immediately snaps into action. Blaine is calling out for help. Charles identifies that Blaine needs help, identifies Iro's down. And Charles Beckford is a canine handler as well and has additional training and a med kit specific to canine uh, trauma and treating canine wounds. And so Charlie goes to his squad car, obtains the kit, enters back into the garage, and Blaine and Charles then uh, work feverishly to uh, do the best they can to assess all of Iroh's wounds, to stop the bleeding, to pack the wounds, to get pressure on the wounds. And the wounds are many and they're very significant. Iroh sustained significant trauma to his chest, significant trauma to his torso, uh, significant trauma to both right legs and basically his right rear leg was uh, shattered and severely wounded uh, from a rifle round that had penetrated through that leg. And they called in Deputy Michael Viss who was off duty. He is a canine handler as well, a fellow canine handler with our Sheriff's Office. And Mike responds from home in his squad car, bringing a squad car without his canine in it uh, so that we have a kennel to transport Iro in. And as soon as Deputy Viss arrives on scene, Blaine, Charlie, and Iroh are loaded into the back of that car, and off they go to Blue Pearl Pet Hospital in Grand Chute. State Patrol assists us on 41, uh, moving traffic out of the way. Grand Chute PD is there at the off-ramp to guide us into the hospital. And at the hospital, there is an amazing team of surgeons and uh, vet techs who are waiting, uh, knowing what, what is coming in and knowing uh, about the injuries that Iro sustained. And they immediately take him into surgery. And uh, by the grace of God, he is, uh, they were able to save him. They were able to get him stabilized. And he is, uh, continues to remain alive that morning when uh, many people did not think that was going to happen just based on the severity and significance of the wounds. At the same time, you've got a community like Fond du Lac uh, already pouring out support. We've got uh, the woman who made art for Iro, who had that posted back at the scene already uh, that morning. Um, you've got 
law enforcement from all around converging and uh, sending messages of well wishes and uh, you know hoping and praying that IRO pulls through this. And IRO, it's hit and miss for the first couple days. We, we did not know if he was going to survive, but uh, there's many amazing stories in here with IRO's recovery. There's a vet tech whose own personal canine, Dwyer, uh, donates blood to keep IRO alive because IRO had lost so much blood. There's this outpouring of uh, community support. Mindy Leitner, again, the uh, artist uh, that drew this mural and posted it on a fence. This mural kind of becomes a, a sign of hope and inspiration through Fond du Lac. And uh, companies, organizations, businesses band together behind law enforcement and behind IRO. And miraculously, through after many procedures over the course of just six days, Iro was walking out the back door of that hospital to a parking lot full of law enforcement and fellow canines and canine handlers on his way to recovery. And he's not back to duty yet, but I'm happy to uh, share that Iro continues to recover, continues uh, to do well. He's been through many procedures, both big and small, uh, and we have every reason to believe he is going to return to work. In fact, when he uh, came into my office like he often does last week. He was nose in the air sniffing around. He's not going to find drugs in my office, but uh, he's, he's in there smelling for drugs. He's doing his thing, and I think, honestly, if Iro could talk, he would say, what's the fuss? Let's get back to work. Let's catch some bad guys. Let's find some drugs. Let's get back on the streets. And that day, I'm confident, will come that uh, Iro will be able to do that. And we do have IRO here today. We'll, we'll engage in that after the uh, formal closure of this press conference. You'll have an opportunity to get close-up video of IRO, uh, see some of the scars uh, on, his wound, uh, on his body, some of the wounds he sustained, and uh, ask questions further about IRO. And so with that, um, again, I can't thank the Fond du Lac community enough, the law enforcement community, the support has been tremendous, and this is not an easy job. The deputies uh, and law enforcement across the county and the state and the country are placed in these no-win situations all too frequently, and Fond du Lac has certainly had its share of no-win situations, and this was just another example of that. Uh, but thankfully, in this case, Blaine survived, Iro survived, no innocent bystanders uh, whose homes were uh, susceptible to rounds being fired from that rifle in that neighborhood that morning. No innocent bystanders were injured, and the victim was able to uh, escape her captor alive and uh, break free and call for help and get that law enforcement response coming. And uh, again, it's the men and women in blue and brown who protect our community, who I'm uh, you know, very thankful for every day, and I know many in, a, many in our community are very thankful for those people who are willing to, even at the end of their shift, move into harm's way, not knowing what they're going to face, but knowing that there's somebody that needs help and uh, that there's law enforcement officers willing to respond to those calls for help, no matter the danger involved. So with that, I don't know if there's any other questions or uh, for either of us. Otherwise, we can, uh, if not, we can move into a more informal um, meet, meet and greet with Iroh. We can have some clarification. You, know, you may have heard. You're gonna, you said that Deputy Evans fires first, but you said return fire. So, what? Correct. Yeah, so. Through that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, so after you've heard both of us talk about the pit maneuver that was right essentially almost at the driveway off of Western Avenue, that's when Deputy Evans is getting out of the vehicle and then seeing um, Kyle Massey with the AR style rifle giving him <clears throat> commands to stop, which he's not following. So Deputy Evans fires the first two rounds Kyle Massey had not yet fired, and then Deputy Evans sent Iro in to assist, and then. Deputy Evans came under fire after Iro was hit as he was backing away, and that's the point where Sheriff Walsmith was describing how Iro likely saved Deputy Evans' life, or at minimum, prevented significant injuries based on the circumstances. And so then Deputy Evans was returning fire at that point, I think is what the Sheriff was getting to. Thank you. Yep. And then can you just more about the circumstances leading to the, the victim and how, how did she connect with Massey? Was this, were they known to each other? Was what were the circumstances leading up to her? 
Um, all very reasonable questions, but I'm not going to get in. When we look at Marcy's law and privacy, I was reluctant to even share some of those details based on that um, individual's constitutional rights to privacy. And so, you know, some of that may be documented in some of the DCI reports that will be available. But I thought it was important for some of that information to be conveyed because it helps show the mindset of, uh, unfortunately, what was going on for Kyle Massey at that time. I think his family would say this whole circumstance seemed out of character for him and one can only speculate what was going on in his mind other than some of the information uh, we received which led to that law enforcement response. Did Massey have a prior criminal history or any history with sexual assault or kidnapping at all? No, nothing to this extent, no. Which I think is why I described the family's belief that this was out of character for him. Ryan, was there already a plan in place of if a uh, canine was injured that they would go there, or was that all assembled at the time as time progressed of where we were going to bring the No, that is the closest 24-7 hospital, so there are other veterinary services closer. So depending on time of day and nature of injuries, we may take them to a facility that's closer, but that is the closest 24-7 uh, animal hospital uh, with surgery teams on you know, on site and available. So that's why the decision was made to transport him there. And Doug, just a comment on that, and the sheriff kind of alluded to this, but after that, I mentioned the self-inflicted uh, gunshot that was at 61301. You'll see in the timeline that you have the, the first priority for all law enforcement there was still on Kyle Massey and if he was alive or not. And once he was extracted from the vehicle, to perform life-saving measure, measures, and then they were able to turn their attention to IRO. So it was, I, I think, a very agonizing amount of time for anybody that would be um, from the Massey family or law enforcement uh, in their concern for IRO to make sure that everybody was getting the care that could be done. How much time was it between that self-inflicted gunshot wound before, or like you said, when that shot was heard, so it's going to timeline? It is. So the 61301 was the um, self-inflicted gunshot, and then you'll see in the timeline that at 633.14, Kyle Massey was extracted from the vehicle. CPR began at 633.45, so about 20 minutes. Do we know how long the So the, the I think the reports and some of the statements would reflect some of the information of, and I think I mentioned earlier the 13th into the 14th, uh, but I'm not going to get into all the specific details on that. It wasn't um, one thing when we look at Chapter 175 and officer involved deaths. Our our job as a district attorney, we don't look at policy for law enforcement or procedures or things of that nature. We look at whether or not a crime was committed and if a charge should be issued. So there's various things that I understand people may have questions about, but it would uh, some of it's outside the scope of what our duties are for that type of determination. Um, that being said, some of that inf information is likely in the uh, investigation that will be on the Department of Justice website. Sheriff Maltzman, uh, quick question for you. Uh, I know you went into the dog's future, uh, how the dog is doing, um, and I'm not sure if I missed this, but um, do you know what's next for the deputy at this time? Yeah, so Deputy Evans has been on administrative leave as is normal protocol or procedure in these types of circumstances, but uh, he will not be returning to patrol quite yet um, because Iro still needs quite a bit of care. He's kind of working a hybrid, he'll be moving into a hybrid schedule where he'll be working without Iro in the squad car on patrol, but then also Iro still traveling a couple days a week to UW Madison where he's receiving. Uh, rehab and physical therapy, and he has other follow-up appointments with uh, veterinary doctors. But our goal, everything remains on track, is you know maybe sometime later this year, Iro can return to service with Deputy Evans, both uh, paired up in the squad car again, like it was prior to October. And another question for you: uh, How dangerous is this work for canines, and why are they so important for fighting crime? Yeah, I think this is a prime example. I mean, they, they, they are a force multiplier with skills and abilities that uh, a human being doesn't have. They can run faster than we can. They can sniff far greater than we can. And um, they have 
you know, unconditional love for their master and their handler. And you saw Iro, um, you know, following orders and running into that scene and buying Blaine a little more time to uh, what we refer to as get off the X, get off the mark, uh, reload, reposition, and uh, stay in the fight. And had Iro not been there, all of those rounds likely would have come at Blaine instead of those round. Instead, those rounds were uh, fired at Iro, but gave Blaine an opportunity to move, and it also prevented some of those rounds uh, because every round that is missing Blaine is potentially going downrange beyond him and there were all, uh, it was all residential neighborhood and houses behind him. So uh, for certain, you know, in this case, I have no doubt in my mind, Iroh saved uh, Blaine's life and uh, I, Blaine certainly sees it that way too. Um, my last question for you, I know the VA talked about the quote that, um, as we said about how you say dad, now it's time to say you um, as a law enforcement officer. Can you go more into why dogs matter so much to you, just, just in the sense that they're so helpful? I mean, you talk about them as tools, but mm -hmm. I'm sure we can all emphasize it here. They say, man, that's friend, that sort of thing. Why are dogs so necessary to what you guys do? Yeah, our law enforcement canines, uh, we have five of them now that are uh, on patrol at the sheriff's office, and each one of them goes home every night with their handler, uh, lives with their family at their private residence, and then goes to work for eight hours, just like uh, Deputy Evans did that night. And uh, so they're as much of a pet and a part of a family as they are a tool when they're working in law enforcement, and that's, it, they're, Far more than a tool. A tool, a tool certainly underemphasizes just what they what they bring to the table, um, and and so they're a critical part to our operation. I I've never been a handler myself, so I don't know uh, and fully understand the bond that a handler has with the canine, and I don't think anyone truly can unless they are a handler or or have experienced that bond because they're a. Uh, truly a, a two-person or two-man squad car uh, when they're out there on patrol. That is their partner, and they're attached at the hip and uh, go on every call together, as was the case here, and uh, work in tandem and in conjunction with each other to help each other and save each other, and that's exactly what happened here. Thank you, sir. How critical is the body cam put in an investigation like this? I mean, what, more than 50 rounds fired in a matter of seconds? So the, whether it's body cam or squad video, they can be <laughs> instrumental in investigations like this as we've discussed the position of the squad car for Deputy Evans gave a, a view of the shooting that took place it, because part of the body cam for Deputy Evans, um, there were things in the way that, that obstructed, but they don't, they don't show everything. There are still limitations, whether it's uh, when things are further away, lighting, so they're not gonna show everything that a law enforcement officer may see, but they are a huge help to us in conducting these reviews to just help corroborate what the officer is saying so the public, I think, continues to have that great confidence that they do in our law enforcement, especially here in our community. Ryan, you said about 47 shots were fired from the deputy. Was that all from his pistol, or was he able to grab his rifle? All 45 rounds were fired from his duty pistol. But if you have a question about for the sheriff about bonds with cats, I think he might be able to answer that. But I think that uh, wraps it up. Thank you.